I was at Spurs, um, forgive me, and it wouldn't go well for me. Glenn Hoddle was manager. Uh, I'd had a run of games and uh, didn't feel as though I was getting a fair crack of the whip, really. I played uh, season before I left. I played the start of the season, done really well. Uh, they were high up in the league and uh, Christian Zieger, we brought him in the summer and he was injured, so that's why I played and got a run of games. And then he uh, basically, when he came back from injury, he put him straight back in. So it kind of disheartened me a little bit. And that's when I decided to leave. Canute went the other way. And Glenn Hoddle said to me, I don't think you're going to get much game time here. So it was it was the right move for me to make. West Ham unfortunately just got relegated. So I just thought it's the right right move for me to make and I'm glad I did make it. A nice bloke, very nice bloke, genuine, uh, straight down the line. He, he was just a bit too nice to be a manager. That's, that's the only thing I would say about him. And it is, I don't think he's got a job since, has he? So um, it kind of speaks for itself. But a lovely bloke, uh, got a lot of time for him, but just probably a little bit too nice to be a manager, in my opinion. The best has to be Pardew for me. He got the best out of me. I liked Zola, I thought Zola was really good, he had a lot of good ideas, he was uh, still brilliant in training just to watch him, we were in awe of him, he, he was very very good but it just didn't quite work out for me, it hasn't worked out since, I hope he does carry on and try and get a, a job in football because he's got, like I said, he's, he's very, um, he's got new ideas basically, he's in a I didn't say that, he's got fresh ideas and he likes to get that across to the players. Again, maybe a little bit too nice, but in, in respect to Pardew, Pardew is a very good manager. I still rate him to this day. He's, he was, he's probably one of the best I've worked under. He was a very good man manager, tactically very, very astute. Uh, he, he got the best out of the players. You knew there was a line and if you crossed it, he wouldn't be having it. Uh, and he got us to a cup final, two playoff finals. We got beaten one of them, but the second one, we eventually went up and I think he did a good job at West Ham until the Icelandic owners come in and kind of uh, all went a bit pear-shaped. So he was gutted that he left at that time as well. I spoke to him afterwards to say thank you and that, and he was genuinely gutted because he thought he could take the club on to another level. And uh, he, he was a good manager. A lot of people got a lot of things to say about Pardew and whether they're right or wrong, I don't know, but I'm just, I speak as I find and I, I really liked him. Oh, that was unbelievable. It was my first season at the club and obviously things went really well. Just the names on that on that uh, award says it all really, so to be on that amongst that, uh, all those names is really, really humbling and uh, still one of my proudest moments to date in, in my career. Obviously, it's an uh, amazing achievement. I was really proud to win that award. Yeah, it was. Uh, we got beat one 0 in the first leg. And there was a lot of hype and pressure around the game. Was, you know, it was full house at bowling under lights. Don't go much better. And I just remember it was around 60 odd minutes, 55, 60 minutes, and played a short corner with Michael Carrick, and he gave it back to me. And as soon as I hit it, I knew it was in uh, straight in the top corner, and off I went. And it, it was the most amazing feeling I've ever had in my life. I think. Just the noise of the crowd that night, it, the stadium erupted. And it was, Pardew was jumping in with the fans, and you know I look back on that goal quite a lot because it, it was a special, special moment. And just you can just tell when when you watch the goal, the reaction of the fans and everything. It is just the place went mental. And then we went on to win two 0 So put the corner over for Christian to get the second. So it was, that was a special night. Just, it's just a shame we didn't go out and beat Palace in the uh, in the final, but luckily we did it the next year. So. Probably the pain of losing the FA Cup final. It, it, that took me months to get over that. And it's still, I still can't, I've still probably not got over it properly to this day. I'd come off after 80 minutes and genuinely thought we'd won it. They didn't look like they were troubling us any way, shape or form. Gerald had cramp. 
and he's hit one from 30 yards because he couldn't he couldn't run any further basically and just flew in the corner of the net so yeah that took a while that the the, the mood in, in the change room after that game was uh, horrible really the lads just we were stunned we couldn't believe what just happened because for, for the majority of the game we were a much better team and one of them things the playoff final was amazing because there's so much pressure on them games uh, obviously the year before against Palace was a horrendous game and we didn't play well enough but they didn't play well either but it's because there's so much pressure involved I think that's the, that's the probably the problem why you don't see classics really in, in those playoff finals because everyone knows what's at stake uh, so yeah the the overriding emotion was the FA Cup final without a doubt yeah I'd have to say Michael Carrick I was only there a year but uh, just unbelievable footballer and you look what he's gone on and done at United now you don't play for United for how many years that he has if you're a bad footballer and I think he's so underrated in this country we've got um, he's been written off too many times in my opinion he should be one of the first names on the team sheet for England uh, but he was a great footballer great lad I used to room with him when that first year at West Ham and got on really well but just a fantastic footballer two feet passing ridiculous so I'd have to say him you know I played with Tevez as well uh, there was who else was there I'm trying to think Teddy obviously was coming towards the end of a career but still class act yeah, but I'd say Michael Carrier yeah. Mark Carrick for the first season and then uh, David Connolly come he was there the second season I think or maybe he was there in the first season as well but obviously Michael Carrick had left so um room with David Connolly he was a good lad nice enough not someone that I'd necessarily get on with outside of football oh I'm a professional but he he'd wake up early in the morning he set his alarm for seven I like the line on the game day so we were the complete opposites and he'd wake, he'd set his alarm at seven and he'd get his towel out, put it in front of the TV and just sit there in his boxes doing stretches for two or three hours. And I'm thinking, he's got the TV on, he's doing his stretches, making all these noises and I'm thinking, leave me alone, I want to sleep. So that was, uh, that was a bit annoying to be honest. Uh, I, I did, I did uh, say to Pardew, I, I wanted to change rooms but he wasn't having none of it unfortunately. So I'd have to say, Connors was uh, wasn't the best roommate in the world. <laughs> One of the best, I say him because he was manager at the time of Zola. I can't say how good he was. He was ridiculous. He's get me and Bella's Craig Bellamy on free kicks and tell it put uh, mannequins up for a wall and that. And I'd say eight nine times out of ten, he'd show you how to put top spin on it and that, and it go in the top corner, top corner, that corner. It was ridiculous how good he was. Um, but apart from that, playing wise, I would say, even though they was only there for six months, the foe was a joke in training. He was so sharp, his finishing, his feet, both feet, always putting it in the back of the net. Michael Carrick's an obvious one again, um, one of the worst, I'd have to say. Um, you know, Coco wasn't the best, if I'm being honest, um, although he probably thought he was more often than not. Marlon, Marlon was Mar Marlon could finish to be fair to him, but he was another one of the, again a little bit touch tackle. Uh, but I, I'd I'd go for Nigel and Marlon probably. They they weren't the best trainers in the world. In in regards to uh, trying, Tevez when he first came to West Ham didn't try a leg in training, wasn't interested whatsoever. But then when it comes to a Saturday, he. Uh, he always produced the goods. So, and I've heard from players since when been at Man City and that with him. He was a very good trainer, but for some reason, I think he was finding it hard with the culture and the language and that he he, he didn't seem interested, to be honest. But turned on on a Saturday, that's all that matters. I'd have to also say Ravel Morrison. I trained with West Ham for three weeks in in the summer. Uh, Sam invited me along and I was so impressed with him. I can't tell you how good he was technically. As I remember playing with Joe Cole, and against him. I played with him for the England youth teams and played against him uh, when I was at Peterborough. And he's obviously at West Ham and Joe was outstanding. He was far and away the best at, at his age. But for me, Ravel's better. He had so much ability. I cannot tell you how much ability that lad's got, but unfortunately he's not making the most out of it at the minute. Uh, I spoke to a few of the boys at West Ham and they've, they've tried to get round him and rally round him, but he'll 
especially at that time where he was in the first team and playing really well and scored a goal against Tottenham. He, for some reason, he, he, he loses interest for whatever reason, outside influences, we don't know, but I've, I've yet to be as impressed as I was with him for a long, long time. He was that good. He could do anything with the football. He was outstanding. Yeah, there was a couple. I don't know if I should say or not. I love I, one of them. I always wind him up up in training because Marlon, good lad. I, you know, I see him now and get on with him, or whatever. But he was uh, quite confident in his ability, Marlon. And he'd be, give me the ball, I can score. Give me the ball, I'll put it in the net. And he was having an absolute mare in training. So I was on him all game. And obviously, Marlon's twice the size of me. So he got in the change room and he just took his top off and said, "Come on, I want it." And I thought, <laughs> "Really?" And I said, uh, "No, I'll leave it. Thanks." And uh, he, he just lost the plot with me. So yeah, that was one. I think I got to him a little bit too much on that one. First of all, it was wow, what's going on here? I couldn't believe it really. Obviously two big names. And then I think everyone felt a bit threatened that we were gonna sign next. And obviously everyone thinks that their, their place is up for, up for the taking, so for me personally, Tevez come in and played on the left hand side with three up front. Hard to put him in in, in Europe in that, uh, the qualifiers against uh, who do we play away from home? Palermo. And it, it won a shock, but one that obviously the club's going to have a go now and maybe bring in some players that are um, better than us, basically. So we felt a bit threatened with it all. But it was also a good thing, obviously, for, for West Ham and um, raises the profile, better quality players. So we didn't obviously have an idea of what was going, going to happen after that, but it wasn't a bad thing. It just obviously competition for places, which is always good. But I, I just personally felt a little bit threatened, obviously, that Tebe was going to come in and take my place, but he, he ended up playing a bit more centrally than he in, in the end. But um, yeah, they were, they were two fantastic players. I'm, I'm surprised Mascarano didn't play as much as he did, because in training he was a joke, how good he was. And for some reason, Pards didn't really want to play him that much. And... Um, was it curvishly after as well? So it was a strange one for me. Nobes is always a bit of a character. Mark's a bit of banter and that. He's still like that to this day. Um, Jimmy Walker, big character. Nice fella, absolute lunatic. To be fair, we had a good bunch of lads over, over the time. Lee Bowie was a good character. And quite sharp, quite witty. Him and Bellamy used to knock away at each other constantly in training. Um, <laughs> uh, Bo used to call Bella's uh, Shergar because Bella's had his new uh, teeth put in. <laughs> and uh, Bella's used to call uh, Lee Bowie a Stewie Little, the mouse. <laughs> they used to all, all day, every day be doing that. It was quite funny. They were either side of me as well, so it, it was quite quite funny. They were always at each other. So yeah, you, you have that most change rooms to be fair. So <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was one of them. Lucas Neal was a good lad, great, good character. Always organising things for the lads, you know, not necessarily nice out or nothing, but just like go karting and that. He always wanted to keep the team together. Um, he's a good captain, Lucas. Um, so yeah, plenty, plenty of good lads. Plenty of uh, not so good lads as well. It's, it's all in all walks of life, but there are plenty of good lads there. I want to say it caused unrest. There were maybe fractions of lads that were, were talking about it and not too happy. Um, but it happens in football. You know, it's, it's the way the game's going now and you just got to get on with it, really. The, 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 yeah, I'd, I'd say there was a little bit of uh, bickering and bitchiness going on, but nothing that would cause any problems, really. It was, it was spoken to between, them, between the lads themselves. Um, but the only problem, I think, that us as players that were on, weren't on no wages that other players were on is they were hardly playing most of them so that kind of winds you up a little bit you know but his, his club have decided to pay that money for those those players it's their money they can do what they want with it but we thought we we got the club into a fairly decent position and then these players have come in but for most weeks they weren't fit that that was the only issue some of the lads had I think
Yeah, I didn't get them to be honest. Um, you know, the lads weren't earn, earning the fortunes that some of the lads he brought in and, uh, were earning, so to speak. So, you know, got, got a bit of money around you, want to get a nice car, then it's up to you what you want to do with your money, isn't it? It's, as long as you're performing on a Saturday, that's all that matters. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand that, those comments and you know, I was probably trying to deflect a little bit away from what was actually from, from himself and, and how he was doing as a manager, albeit he did keep us up in the end. No, he wasn't a dis disruptive influence, Nige. That's one thing he definitely wasn't. Nige was very brash, confident in himself, confident in his ability, probably sometimes overconfident, if you ask most of the lads. But he, he wasn't disruptive, Nigel, no chance. He wasn't at all. Just um, he was the way he was, you know. I think some players, they, they have to be that way so they can get the best out of themselves. They have to believe that they're actually sometimes better than they actually are, just so they can perform at a high level, you know. And, um, that was the way Nigel was. He he was very self confident, which is is probably a good thing. But he he was not in by no way in any means uh, disruptive in any change. I mean, he's a good lad. Could have a laugh with him, a bit of banter, um, and and that was it. Not disruptive at all. No chance. I remember being in the away changing room because Kerbishley left me out again. Um, so, <laughs> but I watched it on the screen um, in, in the change room. They got a big plasma in there at United and I watched the game on there. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Obviously, jumping up and down the change rooms over the moon. Uh, luckily, United had already won the title, but it was still an unbelievable performance, wasn't it? And it was a uh, day to remember. Tevez producing the goods he did all towards the end of that season, really. And somewhat single-handedly kept us up, and that's why he's a, a legend in West Ham fans' eyes now, and, and rightly so. He, he t definitely turned it on for those last few months and, and kept us up. So fair play to him, and you've got to give credit. Although he wasn't my cup of tea, you've got to give credit to Kerbishley also. Um, whether it was by hook or by crook, he, he did keep us up. So you've got to give him credit for that. I remember Zola coming in and uh, doing really well under him. He, first and foremost, he liked me as a player. He saw me in training, pulled me to one side. He goes, I like you. He goes, I mean, you've got a few problems with your back. Uh, I'm, he, he did yoga himself. He goes, I'll come with me after training. We'll go in the gym. We'll do a few yoga stretches and that. And I'll, you get into it. He goes, it'll help you eventually. Unfortunately, at the time, and I regret this massively, it's one of the biggest regrets in my career, that I didn't want to listen. I, my head was at my backside due to my gambling. I, my head was all over the place. And, uh, you know, I've got GM Franco Zola there wanting to help help me. And I don't want to listen. It's, I'm a fool for doing that. I know that. And like I said, he's a big regret of mine. And he kept trying and trying. And I scored a few goals in the first handful of games under him. was doing well. And uh, I think in the end, he just gave up on me. And rightly so, to be honest. And... Uh, I didn't play for the last half dozen games before I left. Had a little niggly, niggly injury as well, and then the January transfer window come up, and uh, Tony Pulis asked permission, asked phones over up, said, "Can I can I speak to Matty and his agent?" So I went up there and, and spoke to them, and, and Zola let me go. So it, it's definitely I got a lot of time for Zola. He was a lovely bloke, but also I think he's a good manager. And like I said earlier, I had a lot of good ideas. And I just wish I'd have listened to him because. When, I first, when he first came into the club, I started out and then I was scoring against Newcastle at home, Fulham away. It was going well. And if I had just listened to him, maybe I'd still be at West Ham you know, up until I retired. You know, It was just a shame the way things worked out. It, I, I came, kind of left on a bit of a, a sour note, all, all my own doing, nothing to do with the West Ham fans or nothing, all my own doing because I had my own personal problems. I do regret that a little bit because I had five and a half great years there loads more good memories and I have bad memories and uh, it was just a way, a bit of a shame the way it ended, you know. Yeah, obviously I was towards the back end of my, of my West Ham career, I was in a bad place gambling wise, I think everyone knows about that, we're not going into that too much but 
it did affect me towards the back end of the start. It didn't affect me at all because the football was actually released, getting out on the pitch and in the training ground. But yeah, just uh, the way I the way I left, I think that that's that's a big regret of mine leaving West Ham. It was uh, I felt like I could stay there for for a good few few more years yet, and uh, fortunately, with everything else going on in the background, it it was probably the right thing to, for me to move at the time. Although deep down, I don't think I did well. I didn't want to move. Uh, and like, like I said, the Zola thing, not listening to him, and you know, when you got a Premier League le- uh, legend wanting to give you advice, most most people take that advice. But it shows where I was at the time. I, I didn't want to, didn't want to know, and stupid, really, really stupid, and something I do regret massively. I'd say it was probably two and a half, three years into my time at West Ham probably. That's when I, I realised I've got, I've got a problem here. Uh, it always takes you quite a while to, to admit defeat. And we're in a business where you train to win and if you can't accept defeat. So me accepting a defeat and gambling's defeat in me was hard to take and I couldn't get my head around it. So um, that was... That was probably that time at West Ham, two and a half, three years into it, where I realised I'm in a bit of bothery, really. So, um, yeah, it was all that West Ham was the best time I had in my footballing career. It was also the worst, probably, off the field as well. So it kind of parallels, you know. It was it was weird how it worked out, but again, all learning curve, and, and uh, you got to learn from it. If you don't, then you're a fool. It affected everyone around me, everyone that was closest to me, especially my family. Uh, you know, people were talking, uh, as people do, and it, you know, it was affecting them. But I didn't realise how much it was affecting them because I was wrapped up in my own little bubble, and it was it was all about me, and it was all consuming, and it's all I all I wanted to do was think about my next bet well I didn't I didn't realize how much it was affecting everyone be, uh, around me basically uh, so yeah no I didn't strain any relationships at the club to be that's God's honest truth that they got to a point it was it was well publicized that we did have card schools and Teddy didn't take as much money as off me as everyone thinks but uh, yeah Teddy was involved Yossi Benny and a few other lads and th- there was probably too much money at stake first and foremost but and, then, and to be fair Apaji nipped it in the bud straight away when he found out but there was never any arguments any fights or anything like that it, it never got uh, heated or people were holding grudges or anything like that. That, that that wasn't the case it was more the fact that if you were going if you were losing money on the day and you got to go out in the afternoon and play a game of football you don't want to be going out thinking, oh, he took that money off me, kind of thing. That was that was where Pardew was coming from, and I can I can see that without a doubt. And it was getting out of hand, to be honest, on away trips and that. Um, you know, we were talking thousands of pounds. So that was uh, Pardew's done the right thing, nipping it in the bud when he found out. Yeah, I did without a doubt. Uh, the club supported me wholeheartedly. Alan Pardew did. Alan Kerbishley did as well. I must say that he, he was he was very good to me. Um, and they said, if if you need help, we're here. But the, the problem is with all addicts that until you till you say you want help, until you want to say I've got a problem here, I need someone to help me, then no one can help you. You know, you can you have all the people in the world saying to you, you've got a problem, you need to sort yourself out. But until until you're ready to admit defeat and say, Do you know what, I've got a problem, then you can't help. No one can help you. You know, you've got to help yourself first and foremost by admitting you've got a problem. And I wasn't ready to do that at the time. Stupid as it was, I wasn't. And luckily, eventually, I did. But it didn't happen when I was at West Ham. The trigger point for it was, I was doing all my dough. I was, uh, it was driving my family absolutely crazy. And I come home from bookies one day and they knew where I'd been but I'd lied, said I'd gone down the shop but they, they knew full well where I was and uh, my mum and dad, who were separated but they, they'd made the effort to come, my girlfriend and uh, my now wife 
and my sister were around the table and just said, this, this has got to stop now. And, I, and to be fair, I was ready to stop. He had beaten me. Like, it was just admitting it had beaten me, you know? And uh, yeah, from that day, that, that was it. So luckily, I had, I had them around me to support me. And uh, then that seat next season, I went on, went on and got a player of the year at Stoke and had a really good season. So this goes to show, really, it, it was affecting me towards the end of, it, of, of the, the back end of the years of my gambling, without a doubt. The advice I give to people that are, uh, have got an addiction or are, are out the other side and, and going through it and trying to combat it is uh, what, ask for help from others. Like I said, first and foremost, you've got to admit you've got a problem. And then go to meetings. I go to GA meetings and just speaking in a room with people that have got the same problems as me. And, and it helps me. I come out of the meeting feeling a lot better than I did when I went in. And that's what I've got to do for the rest of my life. If I, if I stop doing it, then there's every chance I'll, I'll have a punt again sometime um, in the future. So I know what I've got to do, and luckily enough, I'm, I'm doing that at the minute, and long may it continue. It'd be winning the FA Cup final. It'd be uh, Gerard not in that shot in the 89th minute, whenever it was. That that was a. Yeah, I've played in two cup finals and to lose both of them is devastating. But the one I lost when I was at Stoke against Man City, we weren't really we weren't really at the races that day, and they were the better team and probably deserved to win it. Whereas the, the West Ham game, we, you know, for the large parts of the game, we were the better team, and to not come away from that with an FA Cup winners' medal, uh, you know, we'd gone down in in history at West Ham, which would which would have been amazing. So yeah, that's got to be the, the biggest regret is not getting that winner's medal. Someone that entertains, you know, when I was at my best, I like to think I entertain the fans. I was always positive on the ball. Uh, always wanted to beat my full back and, and get some decent balls in the box. So yeah, I'd like to think that I entertained them when I was at my best at West Ham and chipped them with a few goals here and there as well. You know, I, was, I played in some some big games at West Ham, two playoff finals and an FA Cup final, so yeah, some very good memories. At one point, quite close, it's probably worked out for the best if I'm being honest, it was like a bit of a fairy tale for me to maybe finish my career at West Ham, I'd have absolutely loved it, but looking back on it now, it probably wasn't the right thing to do. Um, I, I wasn't a player, I was when I left West Ham, uh, that's for certain. And my bait was giving me so much trouble that it, it, it probably wasn't the right thing to do. I, I, the first week, I was there for two and a half weeks. The first week I went in, done really well. We were just doing uh, short, sharp training, keep balls, five side, etc. And my back could put up with that. And the next week, Sam, they just brought in Valencia and uh, Coyote, Zerati, Sacco, and Ravel played in the game as well. We had like 11, 11, 11 v 11 with the 21s. And I played in it, uh, three thirty minutes. Sam refereed it. The first thirty minutes, I'd done brilliantly, and uh, with a few goals up, I'd scored one, set a couple up. I was thinking, I feel good here. It's going well. And then we had a five ten minute break. My back just completely locked up, and uh, you know, I, I couldn't couldn't raise a canter after that. Basically, just uh, Sam seen it. He wasn't stupid. And a few days later, he, he pulled me and said, look, I've seen you in the game, you look really, really good. He goes, but you, you're not moving like you used to. Uh, I said, no, you're right. And then he, he signed down with Fatano a few weeks later. So it, it, it was fairly close, but there was no talk of money or wages or anything like that. Sam just said, I like to look at you in the first week. He said, well, I'll keep, uh, keep having a look at you, get your fitness up and that, and see where it goes from there. And it probably worked out for the best. Um, it's like I said, I wasn't the same player I was before. It was the most random situation. Basically, I thought after doing training with West Ham and sorting my back out, I thought I'll give it one more go. So my agents called me up and gone, do you fancy going back to Millwall? Just going back to Millwall? Going to Millwall, sorry. And uh, I was like, Phew. I've got a lot of friends that are West Ham fans as well. And obviously I know the majority of West Ham fans still like me and uh, it was, it was like, I said, all you got to do is go in and train. So I said, yeah, go on, I'll go in and train. 
and uh, I did. I went in for one day. My back was knackered at this point anyway. I knew it halfway during training when it started going into spasm and that, so I, I didn't want to be there. It was the most uh, strangest feeling walking in there because obviously I played in West Ham Millwall games in the Championship and they're not a uh, pleasant environment to say the least. So going in there was uh, very strange, very surreal. Didn't feel right at all. And uh, I. Uh, got in the car, went home and, and didn't go back, called Holloway, said this ain't right, my back's not right first and foremost, but um, signing for them wouldn't have been right, I think I'd have lost uh, a lot of uh, a lot of friends first and foremost, and I don't know if I would have been invited back to West Ham either, so again, worked out for the best without a doubt. There was never any talk of me signing, it was just basically to go and, and train for a few days just to get some fitness out, but you know, unfortunately it was Millwall. I could tell as it goes when I went in there uh, that they they were going to struggle that season. There wasn't a lot of quality there, so well, that was another reason really. But I ended up going down, so uh, and, and Holloway left. But yeah, it nev never 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 was going to happen, and thank God it didn't. At the minute, uh, doing a bit of media work, quite enjoying it because I just see a different side of football. Really, as you when you're a player. Most players do all they can to avoid the media. But <laughs> I was probably one of them. But now it's it's nice to see it from a different side of view, and you know, respect the job that they do. It's not easy. You know, most players, I think, you hear pundits and commentators talking about football, and you think, oh, it's easy. You just reel off whatever you want to reel off. But there's there's an art to it. You have got to do your research, etc. So that that kind of thing interests me for the time being. But I do want to get back into football. Cause it's all I know. It's all all. Uh, kicked the ball since I was knee high, I made my debut when I was 15 years old and football's all I know so I want to get back into into coaching or management eventually, do my B licence in the summer in Wales uh, with a few of the Stoke boys and Kevin Nolan's on it as well, uh, James Collins is doing it as well so that'll be that'll be good, familiar face is doing that with them and yeah get into coaching then, get into management eventually, I do, I do want to manage one day and you never know, I might manage West Ham, that'll be a dream. Yeah, I met with someone today and uh, met with the publishers who, who were going to do the book for me and fund it all. And then I met with a ghostwriter as well, a fellow from York uh, that's ghostwritten many books in the past. So yeah, we were just going over the fundamentals of it all. Uh, we're going to start. I'm going to start meeting him in, in July. You know, I reckon it's going to take around 30, 40 hours to go over it all, which is a, a lot of talking. But I find it quite therapeutic talking about you know, where I was and what, what was going on because it makes me not want to go there again, you know, so it's always a good thing to, to talk about it. It's, I never minded talking about it. And uh, by the time it gets published, and then I'm hoping this time next year, it'll, it'll be out on the shelf. So um, it'll be a good read. There's a lot of crazy stories in there that you wouldn't believe possible for a Premier League footballer. So I'd recommend anyone to buy it. I tell my mates, you know, some a story comes to me and I'll tell my mates when I'm, having a drink with them or having a bit of food or whatever and they're like you've got to do a book you, 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 the, these stories are too crazy to be true so yeah it should be decent do you know what it's hard to put a finger on on what it is exactly it just gets you uh, it, the atmosphere around the place even at the training grounds in, in the stadium uh, Everyone's got a character, you know, East End thing. It's yeah, uh, uh, everyone's nice and respectful, but also have, you can have a laugh with them and a bit of banter. The fans, if if you do it on the pitch for them, you know, they, they won't forget that. And uh, extremely loyal people. That's that's probably the best thing that I, that I like about West Ham as a football club and the supporters. Extremely loyal and. Uh, like I said, it, it's hard to put one exact uh, point on on why West Ham is such a great football club, but it, it just it just gets you, it gets you, uh, gets you in your heart, and it certainly got me. Although I went on and, and played for Stoke, it, the West Ham will, will always be the team that, that I follow and, and support.